everybody, it's Carter, and welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the conversation series between writers. And if you are um, listening to this and not watching this, then you are not seeing my dog attacking me as I'm trying to record this. She's uh, bored, and she said she's done sleeping in the in the chair behind me in my office where she spends a lot of time, and now she's trying to climb all over me. Um, so pop on over to uh, to my website or to YouTube if you want to see what this uh, mangy beast looks like. Um, quick note, uh, just uh, registrations are open for my Unbound Writer uh, retreat. Uh, I have two of them this year in uh, May and in October. Um, head on over to carterwilson.com and you'll see links for retreats as well as for my one-on-one -on -one coaching, my Unbound Writer one-on-one -on -one coaching where I work with writers at all levels, um, whether you're thrice published or aspiring, um, I can help you figure things out and make you accountable in your writing. So today on the show, um, I had Matt Coyle. So Matt Coyle, Matt and I know each other a little bit. Um, we knew each other mostly because we used to have the same publisher, Ocean View Publishing. Um, and he is the author of um, the best-selling Rick Cahill crime novel. So he just actually finished his series, a series of 10 um, Rick Cahill novels, um, and, and his final book, which was just out at the end of last year, was Odyssey's End. So I highly encourage you um, to, you know, if you haven't read any of the Rick Cahill uh, books, start with number one, go all the way through. You are going to be well satisfied and pleased um, because Matt is a terrific writer. Um, and uh, if you wanted, I'm sure you could just pick one up and read it standalone if you wanted to, but obviously it makes much more sense to read the series. Um, and he's all, he's won all sorts of awards, been nominated for tons of awards as well. Um, he, he's a fantastic writer and, you know, he, you know, he's somebody who had this massive gap between graduating college with a desire to write and actually sitting down and writing. It was from, you know, the age of 21 until he started writing 43, where he thought about it. And that is a pretty common story. Um, and I think we touch on it in this episode that, you know, if, it, if, if you are a writer, whether you're actually writing or not, if, if, if the universe has chosen a, a, and you and pointed at you and said, you're going to be a writer, it's going to come out of you one way or another. Um, and finally came out of him at 43. And, and as he describes it in this episode, it was, you know, it was kind of a lightning bolt moment where he, it just, it just, and I've gone through it too, where you do it that first time, and it's a tremendous amount of work, obviously, writing a novel, and your first novel is terrible usually, but you do it and you're like, well, you know, this is me. I have just unearthed me, uh, maybe for the first time in my life. And you just know that you're going to be doing this forever and ever and ever. As long as you have the ability to write, you're going to be doing it. Um, and so you get, it's not even an addiction. It's just you realize like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and you were just kind of uh, acknowledging that and um, and giving yourself permission to to be that, even though it's a scary thing, and even though the chances of any kind of success are slim. Uh, it just if you have that passion for it, it just wraps it <laughs> wraps its fingers around you and pulls you in. Um, so Matt and I talked a lot about shop, a lot about you know that kind of journey as well. Um, and, and then we touched on obviously his books and specifically his character of Rick Kale and. You know, with making that decision or having the talent writing hardboiled crime to make your characters relatable, but not necessarily likable. Um, so we talked about that quite a bit. Uh, this is a good one. I think you're going to like it. This is my conversation with Matt Coyle. Said both. Are you like, I, I, I struggle reading, which sounds terrible because you hear all this advice is like you, you, the, the number one thing you have to do as a writer is read. And I read, I read every day, but I read in bed. Right. So it's like, it could yeah. be five minutes. And then the next day is like, I got to reread those five minutes. Cause I don't know what the hell I, read. I I'm the worst. Exactly. But you know, anything that helped me get to sleep, I'm up for. Yeah. It <laughs> takes, it takes a while to read. Yeah. It does. Uh, and I, and I tend not to read thrillers or mysteries you know i don't know why i just don't um unless i'm being asked to and i love what i do uh but i tend to read nonfiction. i don't know if that's just because you know i think i like it but i also 
I'll, it doesn't mess with my headspace if I, right. you know, I don't know if you're the same way or not. I actually read, I read the genre. I can read it while I'm writing. I, I don't care, but um, I do like occasional nonfiction. I'm actually reading nonfiction right now for a blurb, which is bizarre. That huh. has to blurb something nonfiction. Is it true or, crime or? Uh, man, I can't. It's about, it's about a lawyer, an old time lawyer. Oh. Famous lawyer. That's all. I, I don't think I should say anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I would love to. I would love to blurb a true crime because I love true crime. Yeah. But no, interesting. Nobody's asked me. I just finished uh, a biography of uh, Siskel and Ebert. Oh, wow. <laughs> which, huh? which was which was great because you re, you realize the influence that they had on the entertainment complex, and it's it's pretty profound. These kind of these schlubby guys. Right, but it's it's pretty fascinating to to have read all that. So you're um you're in uh, sunny San Diego, is that right? It is very sunny today. Yes, are we have you... rain coming. More rain. We're not used to, but yeah. Are Today's you a cool. Californian? Did you grow up in yeah. California? Where Southern Californian? Yeah. I was, I was uh, Westlake Village, Thousand Oaks, is where I no. uh, I grew up. And, nice. and were you in San Diego the whole time? Pretty much. I ventured as far north as Santa Barbara to go to college and. Uh, take drugs and drink but was that uh, a no, ucsb right. yep. yeah gauchos the yep. mighty gauchos i had a couple of buddies who went to ucsb and uh yep i think you just described it pretty spot on <laughs> it was fun <laughs> beautiful beautiful yeah. well i hope you invested early in san diego real estate years and years, huh. and years ago <laughs> i wish <laughs> it wasn't even affordable back then well it's funny that the home that i grew up in my parents uh bought when i was four um they got it was a, it was a house in the track section home a uh, part of la jolla i think they paid it was 1963 shows you how old i am i think they paid uh twenty four thousand dollars and yep. um when we had to move my mom it sold for a lot more than that uh <laughs> 40 or 45 years later yeah that's the key to investing is buy low wait 45 right. years sell high <laughs> if you're still alive <laughs> right um did you, like, what were your parents doing growing up? What kind of work were they in? My dad was, uh, my mom was a homemaker. Um, she, Although she'd been, before she got married, she was, I think, the second group of what they called stewardesses back then for United. Hmm. Um, but then she got married after a year and you couldn't be married and do it back then. That wasn't allowed. And my dad was in uh, insurance. He was in, um, like, uh, construction insurance his whole life until so, he retired so no writers in the immediate family. well it's funny you should ask yes there were writers there was I'll, I'll give you the less famous one first my my mom's grandmother who i never met um came, came east came west on a stagecoach hmm. and she wrote poetry about it and they were really good and in fact hmm. somewhere i hope i still have a you know we had a book print of her poetry but on the more famous side, on my dad's side, his aunt, my great aunt, who I met a couple of times, uh, wrote the play Harvey about the eight, uh, six foot tall, invisible rabbit. rabbit. Yeah. Made no into kidding. a movie with Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. No was kidding. Mary I didn't Chase. know that, that was a play first. I had no yeah. idea. She, in just... fact, this is how <laughs> this is how strange things were back then. Okay. She wrote a play about a guy whose best friend was a six foot invisible rabbit. That year, it won a Pulitzer. Oh my God! So clearly, uh, the judges were high. <laughs> well, <laughs> it sounds, was a great movie. Great I movie. mean, it sounds like a children's book when you think about it, like just from the pitch. Right. Um, but it was a great movie. Yeah, that's wow. So, but uh, where? So I'm just curious. As you were growing up, um, did you see any spark of creativity? Were you? Were you? Uh, were you? I mean, I know you ended up getting an, an, an English degree. So there must right. have been something early on where like, I really like stories. Yeah, I did. Uh, I wrote, I read Agatha Christie when I don't know, I don't know how, what are you, 10 when you're reading yeah. that? And, yeah, right. And author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, I read Holmes. And because um, I like the idea when you're young, you like the puzzle pieces and all that. <clears throat> And then my dad gave me a simple art of murder when I was a teenager, young teenager, and that got me <laughs> on to Raymond Chandler. And then I went to Ross McDonald and 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 uh, Hamlet, of course. Um, but so you loved you know, all the, the hard boiled stuff. 
I did. I, as yeah. soon as I started reading Hardwell, it's just, you know, it changed everything for me. I realized that sometimes the bad guys win and um, there's gray instead of just black and white. So that really um, sent a message to me, especially when I was a rebellious age, young teenager. So yeah, I've read the, I wanted to, I wanted to write crime from way back then. I just didn't do it for a long time, but uh, yeah, I did get a degree in English, which is good for the course I took, the, the course in life I took, because I, I you basically get an English degree. You want to be a teacher, you want to be a lawyer or maybe a writer. And so that helped me in my restaurant jobs and my sales jobs mm -hmm. <clears throat> until I finally started writing when I was about 43. But um, yeah, but I always knew I wanted to and I felt like I was wasting all this time not doing it. So I was I was developing that angst and guilt that I needed to write the character I write, Rick Cahill. So all those years of not writing and feeling I should, feeling I was a failure and wasting my life really added up to being able to write uh, 10 <laughs> books in a series. <laughs> well, and it adds up to writing a hard boiled character, right? Because right, exactly. that, that gloom and that bleak is, is so central to that, which is always what's fascinated me. Like, you know, once hard boiled really started coming out, it really, the, to your point, it showed the gray, maybe for the first time. And also, like you said, that the bad guys can win sometimes. Yeah. And because it was so clear cut, you know, it was so hero driven before that. And everything always ties up nicely. The hero is never wrong. And now you have, you know, alcoholics, you know, <laughs> suicidal characters who have some, you know, some sense of humanity left just enough in them to pursue some kind of justice, but it's, it's, it's gloomy reading. And that that's, it's interesting that that's what you kind of clung on to. It's just like, this is different. Do you have that sense of like, this was just not this cookie cutter kind of thing? Yeah. I, I, when I first started reading uh, Chandler, I knew I wanted to write first person PIs. It just, it was in my head. I never, never wanted to venture outside anything else. I wrote some crappy stuff when I graduated from college that, you know, hopefully is lost somewhere. Right. Um, <laughs> angsty, more angsty stuff. Uh, but no, in the back there, it was always, it was always crime. It was always in first person and it was always kind of a lone wolf. I really liked the aspect of a lone wolf. Although and I kind of think of, uh, I kind of think of hard boiled as uh, and PI fiction as Westerns to some degree, because mm -hmm. you've got the outside person coming into a different world and they're trying to solve this, this crime that um, may be covered up by even the, the people who aren't um, completely involved. You know, they're afraid of the, the greater powers and it's not always appreciated. Like after the and then when the westerns the 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 gunman the gunslingers always always has to leave because he's not he's too he's too western for this for the for the growing uh, culture you know he's right. needed to for, to do a job but then we can't live with someone of violence and so he has to leave Shane Shane come back Shane well and they movies. also operate outside the law most of the time exactly um, in both My scenarios guy does. <laughs> yes but that's. That's how they get shit done, basically. Right. Um, and that becomes the great part of it all. It's like you, you're, you, it means uh, the, the ends justifying the means, for sure. Yeah, and that's something that's something as, I, as this, this character, because I when I first started writing, he was much lighter, but he got, he's gotten darker. He's kind of a roller coaster, his career, his career, his, his life in the books. Um, but he grapples with the ends justifying the means. He realizes what he's doing is what the people he's pursuing do, do in some degree they're following their own sense of justice their judge jury and in his case executioner at times right. he's he's actually murdered people right and um with his own sense of justice uh but he he doesn't grapple with grapples with it. he doesn't shoot the gun blow the smoke and then move on to the next one it's something he stuck you know he what is this doing to me and am i really a good for society but, yeah yeah well and you have to have those internal self-conflicts right because if you just yeah. write somebody who who's just purely off the rails it's going to be hard for the reader to connect to them conversely if you write somebody who is just it's so vigilante driven and and it's so much baked in justice like of course he's going to kill uh the rapist or the child molester then it becomes right. a little bit too easy um you know you you want kind of the reader to be like i I'm not sure if I like this dude, but I want to know what happens next. 
And that's exactly. a hard balance, right? How do you how do you work with that? I think book you, after you, book after book. You absolutely hit the nail on the head for me because I first of all, my guy Rick Cahill is not he's not the smartest guy. Um, he's 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 a bulldog. He's he he definitely goes after what he thinks is right. Um, he follows the the credo given down given to him as late father, which is sometimes you have to do what's right even when the law says it's wrong. And he does that, but um, he definitely he, he grapples with it. And I I you know sometimes I read my reviews you know because I'm mm -hmm. I'm a, um, stupid that way. And um, when somebody doesn't like that, sometimes there'll be someone doesn't like it, like a two star review on good Goodreads, and there'll be you know, they just, the guy made mistakes and he was violent. I mean, I'm not making, my guy isn't terribly, he's not macho violent, but um, there's violence. And then I'm thinking, well, yeah, he makes mistakes. Um, that's okay. If they don't like the book because of that, that's okay. Right. Because I, I do make him walk a fine line. I do have him. I've asked my editor at times, is he too unlikable in this book? Um and not unlikable for just because he does have a good heart, but it's just does he do things he shouldn't do and not maybe not always learn from his mistakes? Does that make him unlikable? And, you know, I've, tried, I've made a very damaged guy who does have a tremendous sense of, of right and wrong and a need to because it goes back to his late wife who was murdered and he was arrested for the murder. This is before yesterday's echo the book, the backstory of the first book. He's arrested for the murder and um, which he didn't uh, commit, but he books later, he finds out who did um but there's there's always that sense of he and he kind of he feels like he failed her the night she died he failed her mm -hmm. and so he has this sense to need to redeem himself so he's always trying to redeem himself with every big case he takes and he has to get to the truth of the matter because he didn't have it for i think 15 years maybe with the death of his wife so he's driven and he's compulsive and he's manic at times not a crazy manic but just has to get things done that it's kind of well, I don't know, this guy's a little much, but you know. And then I try to. He's got a dog. He has a dog, of course, so that right. softens him a bit. And he, <laughs> right. he actually, I was I, when I started writing him, I wasn't going to have him have any friends. He wasn't going to have any friends. Yeah. And then in the second book, I introduced Maura McFarlane, and out of I needed another private eye for one scene, and they got in a verbal tangle, and I just liked the way they communicated, and so she became sometimes partner is best friend best thing i could have done for the series never would have gone to 10 books if i hadn't done that yeah. but in much too dark much too internal um but so i've softened him a little bit from from this dour creature that i wanted to i mean i would have loved 10 books of him just being <laughs> dour so was gross. that introduction of a friend a suggestion from an editor or did it came to you no, it came to me out of the ether like all the best ideas i, I have to do <laughs> right. was i needed i needed somebody another pi they started talking arguing i had right. to put her i go well you know i kind of like her i'll stick her a little further in the book i can see where i could use her and then in book two um dark fishers no book two is uh, night tremors i needed her a little bit and then and after that she was a part she was a yeah. huge part she's the conscience of the series right and honestly it really was the best thing that it was the best thing that i ever stumbled onto wow because it, it softened Rick a little bit. It made she's very confident. Moira is very confident. Um, gets things done. Kind of no bullshit. But she has a son. She's got a she's got a life outside of what she does. But she cares for this guy. Yeah. And she's taken upon herself to to look after him. And, and I, if 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 uh, readers are kind of on the edge, is this guy worth it? They they kind of tune into Moira and say, well, you know, he is. It's funny. Right. When I was at, I'll, I'll just. Quickly, when I was at a, uh, my launch at Warwick's in November, uh, a woman came up to me. I always sit, I uh, kind of I warm myself. I'm my, my own warm up gig for for book talks. I sit there before the start and I talk to the audience. And this woman came up to me. And she goes, "You know, I had to put Rick down on the last book. I just couldn't take him anymore." I went, <laughs> "Okay." And then she goes, "Then you know, I talked to my sister and I picked him up again. And I'm so glad I did." I'm like, "Okay." Yeah, you're my you're my demo, but you're like maybe just a little much over on the other side. But that's kind of that's the world he lives in. That's the character I've, I've written. I'm happy she picked him back up. I'm happy that people consternate about him. But, you know, please keep reading. <laughs> well, and that's the thing about having that friend character or that other close character is they can voice things that the reader might be questioning that the character itself himself isn't aware enough of 
I get the friend could say like, boy, you're acting awful paranoid. And the reader's like, I was thinking the same thing, right? but, but your character might not ever think that because they're too busy being paranoid. <laughs> right. So Particularly it, in first person, when you need that, some that outside influence, that's, that's a really good uh, observation. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that gap between <laughs> graduating college and and sitting down at your your keyboard at, at 43 years old, because I you know I've, I've talked to a lot of writers and it's fascinating to me how like if it's in you and how you can define it being in you however you want, but if the writing bug is in you, it feels like it comes out no matter all your best efforts <laughs> against that happening. And so in my case, I was 33 when I started writing, but zero background in writing, no English major or anything like that. And I'm like, I think this was just supposed to be. Um, you were saying you were, what, so what do you think those major impediments were? Because you were thinking about it for a long time. Was it, you know, it's crazy to write because I'll never have a career at this or I'm not good enough or you just didn't have the passion for it until you finally started doing it. Some of all that, but um, I would say mostly fear and laziness, to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah. Well, it's um, no small task writing a book, as we all know. Yeah. And I didn't realize that the way the way I finally started, it was what stopped me was fear and laziness. What prompted me was guilt and, um, and more fear of failing my life. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I was working, I worked for four golf companies that I helped put out of business in 10 years or they changed were bought by a larger entity. I joke, I was just in sales, but, um, and on the fourth one, I saw that this thing's, I've seen this before, this thing's going down. And when it does, I was 42 or three. I said, when it goes down, I have to, I have a little money saved up. I have to write a book or I can't pretend it's something I'm going to do. Cause I wasn't, I was in sales, but I wasn't, I wasn't trying to get to the next level. I was just trying to make a living. I wasn't trying to make a career because I always had this writing thing, but I wasn't, you know, I'd write, three times a year, three weekends a year, maybe. So I, I had, I kind of had that as a fault where I didn't have to chase life, you know, Oh, I'm going to be a writer, but I wasn't writing. So I finally, I was 43, pretty old. Um, not now. Um, and I said, this is it. When this place goes to under, and I know it's going to, I'm going to take the time and write a book or I can't pretend it's something I'm ever going to do. Yeah. And I did. When the company went out of business, I wrote every day or I, wrote, I probably now write every day. Back then I probably wrote five days a week. Um, and I was, it was one of the happiest periods of my life when I was writing every day and I had, I thought it was a book. It was clearly a first draft. I didn't realize, I didn't know the difference between the two. I was writing in a cocoon. Nobody else. I didn't know about writers groups, any of that stuff. Right. And a guy I worked for in the golf business called me and said, Hey, I need, he was working with sports licensing. He said, I need somebody in sales. Can you come over and help us? And I said, well, you know, I just wrote the book because I told people about, it. you know, I wrote the book. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I probably get it published and buy the house in La Jolla and I'll be good for the rest of my life. No, of course, I didn't tell him that. But I, <laughs> but honestly, it was a week after I wrote that first draft. And I said, yeah, sure, I need the job. And that's when I learned that I, you have to work, when, especially when you're a mystery writer, and have a day job, at least for a long amount of time. So yeah. I learned how to you have to be able to do both. Um, but ironically, uh, uh, I, I, when I finally got an agent, I'd worked. I worked for uh, I worked actually for this company for um, 16 years, so that's uh, how long it took me to quit the day job. But I, I wrote six, five books when I when I had the day job. But I remember when I got an agent, probably five years into the job, and I and I told him we were at a, a trade show. I said, "Hey, man, I I, I got an agent." And he said to me, "He goes, when are you going to quit?" <laughs> and uh, I didn't tell him at the time, but I could have said 11 years from now. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right kind of the way it worked but once but the, the long long story short when i was writing every day i realized this is what i was happier than i'd been probably most of my life this is what i was meant to do good or bad ever published or not published this is the gift that god gave me that i can do better than anything else if it's good enough i don't know but i have to do it yeah. and so that enabled me you know that kickstart enabled me to write when i did have a job because i knew i had to Whereas if I continued to work all that time, I probably would have thought, well, you know, I don't have time to be a writer, blah, blah, blah. Well, then, when, you know, when it touched my soul, when I realized I was doing what I was meant to do, I had to. Well, and once you, because I did the same thing, you know, until last year, I was, I had a full-time job and for years in a totally unrelated industry. Um, 
Yeah. And you learn, you learn that it's not that hard to do both. I mm -hmm. mean, it depends, you know, it's easy to say, but it depends on the nature of your job, obviously. But, you know, I write an hour a day and that's oh, it. You and get a lot done an hour a day. I, do, I get a lot. Well, if I do 500 words, I mean, you do the math, it doesn't take long to get that first draft done. Um, you know, my goal is a book a year, um, which... I think is reasonable. I mean, I know a lot of people write faster than that. A lot of people write slower than that. Yeah. Um, but that works for me. And you realize like, okay, this isn't, it's commitment and it's dedication, but it's not burning the midnight oil um, necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I think the the fear that you're, you're touching on the fear. And, and I think this is when I talk to aspiring writers, it's like, well, the fear of failure is real, but, the reality, the other reality of it is most people do fail <laughs> you yeah. know, the, oh, in the yeah. writing industry. And so in yeah. some way that also takes some of the pressure off knowing like, well, let's just do it anyway. Chances are slim that you'll ever get published, much less even get an agent. Um, yeah. yeah. So just try it. Like what's, and then, and I think you encapsulated it perfectly because once you start doing it, and if it is what you're meant to do, you totally feel that. Like it's yeah. you, like you write that first draft, you're like, well, I guess I'm just doing this for the rest of my life because <laughs> I can't picture myself not doing this. Right. And and if that's who you are, and you're consistent, and you do all the steps that you're required to do in order to try to get published, good things will eventually happen. That doesn't mean. You're going to make millions of dollars. That doesn't mean you're even going to be able to live off of that, but you can have an okay career um, doing yeah. that, but it does take that persistence. Is that how you kind of felt of like let, head down, just kind of keep doing this and see what happens? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I, I needed a day, I needed to work. I needed a day job, but well, taking that little time off to find out that I could write and then I need to write. It made me much more disciplined that, you know, this time after work, this is when I write a certain amount of hours a day. And then I, the discipline really helped me throughout my career, I think. But, but yeah, I was this, you know, I look back at it now and I'm, I'm so, cause I, 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 it took me probably three to four years to write something that I was started to send out um, to agents. And then I think it was five or six years of rejections before I got published. Mm -hmm. So um during that time, like now, as I look back, I mean, during it, it was horrible rejections, ignores. But now I'm so glad that I, I got all those. It took me so long to get published because if somehow I'd gotten published earlier, the first product wouldn't have been as good as it ended up being. Right. And I would have been starting at, a I don't know, a lower level. And I think all those years of working on your craft, revising, revising, revising. It develops that thing called voice that we really, it's nebulous. You can't really, I don't know how to explain it well, but you know it when you read it. Yeah. And especially someone, you know, I read a lot. Of, I read Chandler. He was a huge influence to me, uh, McDonald. So early on, there was a lot of Chandler in my writing. And the more you write, the more you write, the more you find your voice. And I think of somehow, like after three years, I'd gotten published, I'd probably be really derivative. So all it's so easy now, but going through it's terrible. All the rejections yeah. are terrible. Your right. heart's up there. Here it comes. Oh, right. yeah. But now I mean, I'm like, thank God. You say, you know, this massive length of time to get published. That's not an uncommon story, and it certainly resonates with me. My, I, I was fortunate to get an agent with my first book. The same agent wow. I'm still with twenty years later. But my first three right. novels didn't sell. So it was, I think it was probably nine years from when I started writing to when my first book was published yeah. with an extremely small um, press. But it, but you're, I'm interested in, you know, kind of diving into voice a little bit because it is, it's, it's, it's undefinable. And, yeah. and, and I'm not even sure you know when you see it, but I think in retrospect for me, it was when I, my third book, my third published book, when I first shifted to writing first person present tense, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, something's different about, it. and in that case, it was from first person present tense female character and the world just opened up to me. And I, and because I was so tired of people telling me, oh, this person sounds just like you. So I'm like, I'm going to write from a female <laughs> point of view. And I found my voice. I'm like, this is it's me speaking, but it's, it's a totally different structure. And I feel that groove now. Now you've written this from the same, so 10 books in same character, 
same, I assume same, um, same tense. Yeah. Yeah. Did you feel like, oh, by book three, I kind of found the voice that I'm still using today, or has it kind of been steady state throughout? No, I think it, like I said, luckily it took me so long. I think I developed a voice or yesterday's echo came out, but um, I think it, it got better probably for the first three books or so. I think, Maybe I really found my groove in, in Blood Truth, which is my fourth book. And maybe it was because of such a personal book. I don't know. But I remember I was at a writer's conference. Um, Alan Russell, who's a San Diego mystery writer, a really good writer. And he had the misfortune of reading a first draft. It was a mystery conference. You know how readers, uh, writers will send extra money and have their work critiqued. Right. And this was this was twenty plus years ago, and it was thirty pages, which is just ridiculous. I mean, yeah, that is ridiculous. Nobody would even do that now. No, nobody. I'm not going to read thirty pages. Right, five pages. So, yeah. So he told me. He said, "You know, you can write," which was great to hear because I've been writing in a cocoon. I didn't know anything. And he goes, "But it's much too autobiographical." And um, you know, you, the the further you get away from yourself, the better it'll be. And he was so right. Some of the best advice I ever got. So I think with um with all those re- rejections and the it, uh, revisions the further i got away from myself first person male point of view the more i found that real that different voice this is not, you know this is not i'm not rick um so i do think that i developed it good enough before yesterday's echo came out but i i think as i mentioned earlier that the more i wrote it the fur- the the uh the, fur- the further away for me is each book, each book is further away from who I am, which is great. Yeah. Uh, but I really think I found my groove and, and book uh, for blood truth and whether, I mean, if I went back and read all the books now, I'd probably notice the difference between the first two and, and the ones now, but, um, but I don't know if it's, it's that the voice has changed much since then, but I mean, the, the, right now I'm writing something different. I'm writing, uh, I'm writing a third person, scares the shit out of me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I'm writing two different points of view, male and female. And um, I don't have, and my writing process is so messed up that when I wrote the, write the Rick books, I would, I would have a, I have the target out there and I have the, um, the major, the, the um, inflection point, something that happens and gets Rick involved. But I also always had Rick's major, um, subplot what's going on in his life well if he takes a case it's going to make it worse and so i always had that to fall back on and i once i, I just write into rick and i'd find my way through the story well now i got these new characters i'm writing a third person i don't feel as close to them and it's really been a challenge and i don't really know if i'm doing that's something it's funny voice i don't know if there's a I, I think there's i think there's some voice my voice in there but i don't really know if, if i'm if i'm feeling my characters strongly enough yet right you know because writing writing a third is so First person is to me, it's just so easy to, to do. It's easy to do. Writing books hard. We established that. Writing a good books really hard. But you know, you're in the guy's head. Right. It's it's easy when you're not, you know, if it's I write very close third, uh, especially with the one main character. Um, but is it, you know, I'm thinking, is this my secret, is my secret sauce writing in first person? And am I missing it here? And when I finish the first draft, I'm gonna read it all the way through and see if something's missing and, and I can I can adjust back to first person but the reason I'm not writing in first person because I don't want it to be they'll just go well this is just Rick Cahill the different voice different title right so I, so I don't want that but I don't <laughs> so I don't know if I can yeah no that's fascinating and you know I I almost always write first person present tense and I might have a secondary character third person past tense who's got maybe you know, 15% of the book at most. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and my agent always says like very few people write first person present tense. Well, yeah. Um, and I feel like that's my strength. I feel like that's probably your strength and my book coming out in April that the lead character is a 21 year old female savant placed in 1987. And when I set out to write this, I'm like, I don't know if I could be close enough to this person but not only you know her gender but also just she's one of 75 people in the world who have her level of abilities so i wrote it um close third past tense and my editor's like i'm not feeling this book oh wow 
And so I rewrote the first 20 pages, first person present. She's like, there it is. I'm like, wow. So I rewrote the entire book, first person present. Never done that before. It took me four uh -huh. months. Um, and and it's so fascinating. It's such a great exercise if you if you do it, because you know, not only you're not just changing the words, right? Um, yeah. you're not yes. changing like he went to I go. The whole voice changes. So how yeah. that sentence is free. So you're effectively rewriting every sentence of the entire book. And and it's it's fascinating, but it was it was a lot of work. And it, but it was a great lesson to me of like, okay, trust your instincts um mm -hmm. and know what your strengths are. And maybe I'm just not as good writing third person past, which my first two books were. Mm -hmm. Um and so have you been all 10 books um with Ocean View, our good friends at Ocean View? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. They've had a change over Ocean View. Um, yeah. Bob and Pat, Pat uh, just yeah. retired. Uh, yeah. Lee, Lee's taking over, I guess. Right. Ironically, <clears throat> I mean, my plan was really was after eight books was to, to kind of, and they were, they're aware of it because they were, they're wonderful people and they, and they really want to boost writers. That's their whole goal of starting the thing. They want to really want to get writers um, the boost they needed. And so, you know, I wanted to branch out and to, I really couldn't take Rick to another publisher. Um, you know, I, I want to get more exposure up the up the ladder and, uh, which I said, they're completely behind. Uh, I was going to do it after eight, didn't do it. And so ironically, this was definitely, I'd already made my move. I'm going to, this is, you know, this is my aspiration for this book. And then they, then they made the announcement that they, um, had sold to Lee and, I thought, you know, I, I, we already knew that I, I was leaving, but I didn't want anyone to think I was abandoning ship. <laughs> when right. I tried to sell this, when my agent tried to sell this book, um, because, you know, it's, I don't, I, I've been on two book um, contracts since book two. So this is like writing on spec, you might say, because it's, you know, nobody wants it yet. Um, but it's kind of ironic when I, uh, I decided to, to move, they, it's got nothing, they don't core, but I'm wondering if people are like, oh, so you're branch, you're trying to branch out because your publishers left you. But so um, anyway, one of the weird no, things to think about. That, that's not, I mean, but it's, it, you know, I, I had um, several books with, with Ocean View and I always loved them. And, but it is the thing where you're like, okay, do I want, you know, you have these things about, do I get more exposure if I go with the bigger publisher, if I'm lucky enough to get a bit, you know, yeah. and, and ocean view is the only time that I turned down an offer to take a chance um, to sell to a bigger publisher. And I remember that summer we shopped this book to the top, to the big five and they all rejected it. And I'm like, fuck man. Like, you know, you, you, you were out of that rejection phase for years because yeah. you're with, you're in that steady. Okay. But you're kind of wanting a little bit more, and then you're just back to oh my god. But then yeah. you landed with source books, which ended up being fantastic. But it's it, you know you just never know. You just yeah. never know. But it's if your goal is to get a little bit bigger, you got to take risks sometimes, and they might not always <laughs> they, they might not always pan out. But but yeah, you, you got to try. I think. I think. I think also if I was with Penguin right now, and I'd written ten books in Rick Cahill books, I'd be doing something different anyway. Right. Just not, not, not to say I wouldn't be going back to Rick because I can't imagine not writing him for after writing him been in his head for over 20 years. Um, but I, you know, you got to have a palate cleanse and uh, you write standalone. So you get that every time. And which is to me, is really hard to do that. I, I, fall I, back I feel just the opposite. <laughs> I think yeah, series I know, sounds I so intimidating. I know most, most standalone authors I, that I talk to say the same thing, but I'm like, Hey, I can just fall back into Rick's world. I can get into Rick's head. Like you have to recreate a character every time so to me that's proving to be very challenging so um i guess different strokes for different folks but i would definitely be doing a palate cleanse right now challenging myself um you know i look back at all the series authors that i love um michael connelly robert crace um uh chief Jefferson parker doesn't really he doesn't he writes occasional series but um or um cj box yeah you know cj box i don't know how many uh picket books he wrote but when he wanted to do and I blanket on her name when he wanted to do the other series with the the female sheriff's deputy. Um, they said his publisher said, I think St. Martin said, well, we don't really want that. And so he, he took it to somebody else. And so now he's got two publishers with two series. Yeah. Um, which is kind of crazy. They wouldn't say say, but but I do think as you reinvent yourself every book, I do think you need to challenge yourself as a writer, um, instead of just being in that same slot, which is comfortable. 
And I am certainly doing that now. And I'm very uncomfortable. <laughs> but I, but I, I think it's also about writing what is interesting to you and writing what you want to write, yeah. as opposed to writing what you think is the market or is what is expected of you as a current writer. Um, yeah. and, it, and it's scary. I mean, I'm, I'm, Right now, I'm co-writing for the very first time oh, with a wow. buddy of mine, a YA, very dark YA thriller. And, well, dark for sure. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I have no idea if anyone's going to want this, but this is fun as hell. Um, cool. You know, and we're going to spin off a comic book series on it. And I'm like, let's just play with this. Let's just do wow. wild things. But it might flop. Who knows? But it's sure. it's exciting to me, and 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 it also gets you to exercise a different part of your brain, um, and you might, in doing that, uncover strengths that you never knew that you had that you can use in other places. Um, Completely agree with that. So, how did just just to wrap up here? I'm just curious. I'm so fascinated when with, with series and especially like a ten book series. You know, at what point do you know? you know, this is it. Is it because of you feel like it's losing steam? Do you feel like you you couldn't think of another story that, that you were passionate enough about for the series? Or what's that decision process like? Um, Like I said, I, well, for me, it was sort of the business decision because I, I wanted to try to, you can't really, if you're a mid-lister like me, you can't really take your series to you somebody I mean, else. it's impossible to move mid-series yeah. no matter who you are. I mean, it's just it's yeah. very difficult. If you, I think if you break out, you have a better chance. But um, so it was a little bit of a business decision, but I felt I felt that I should pause after eight. And I said, my agent, I'm looking for this amount of money and um this is this is I'm drawing a line in the sand. Of course, they didn't get they didn't get near, they didn't really get near it. They got near enough for me to say yes for nine and ten. But I'm glad I did because um, the latest book's called Odyssey's End, which would make right. people think it's an end. But all I can say is, if it's an end, it ended well. For it ended the way I would have wanted it to. And if it's a pause, it ended on a good spot. To pause. It's a perfect place for it to pause. Right. So I'm glad I ended up writing 9 and 10. <clears throat> I think they're both good books. I'm, I'm proud of them. This book in particular was the hardest book for me to write, except for the first one, I think. <clears throat> it's going through some personal stuff at the time, um, which is back to normal. I'm very happy. Lost my dog, which had been, uh, Angus had been a, in my office for writing. We got him when I was revising, uh, my, my ex-wife and I, when I was revising the first book and he was there for parts of book 10. So that dog was in my office. I'm writing wow. all my books. So um, to write this something different without him was really um, a challenge and some other things. And it's I'm doing something completely different. Yeah. So it's, it's, if I'm looking for a palate cleanse, I've certainly given myself one. I mean, I guess <laughs> I could have changed genres or something, Right. but I'm very, I'm happy. I'd be, pr if Odyssey's end is the last Rick book and that was my, a great concern for me. Can I, is this up to the level? I always feel that way. Is that the level to the other ones have been? And is it, does it do him justice if it's the last one? And I think that it reached that level. So I'm really happy. It was really hard to write. I'm really happy though, that it ended the way it, did, it ended the way it did. Um, just a side note, I've been writing in Rick's world for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine never writing in that world again. I yeah. just can't. Right. You know? Right. But you can also do short stories. You can, you know, there's a mm -hmm. number of different ways you can exercise that. Uh... Well, you should say that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm looking forward to the anthology. Uh, no, uh, anthology uh... No. <laughs> no, but if someone asked me to write a short story and I have an idea and it's a Rick, it's a Rick story and I love the premise and oh. I, I, have, I don't have a date and when it's due yet, but I actually love the idea of it. Interesting. Well, we're going to wrap up. Before we do, we're going to do a little storytelling ourselves. Uh, this is the, the making it up portion of the show. I, I've, I've selected three books kind of at random from my bookshelves. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to have you pick one of those books. We're going to pick a random sentence from a random page. I'm going to read that sentence. And then um, you're going to give me the next couple sentences, sentence or two, what happens next. And then I'll do a sentence or two. And after about two minutes, I'll I'll kill it. But uh, okay, you'd be surprised some of the, sometimes we just like, I think I want to write that story. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. So I've got um, Donna Tartt's uh, The Little Friend, uh, Claire McIntosh's The Last Party, and Darcy Coates' horror novel From Below. So choose one of those. Let's do the, uh, although I'm tempted on Darcy Coates, let's do the middle one. 
Larry McIntosh is the last party. Um, give me a page between one and 400. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't want to get too far to the end. So let's say uh, 47. Okay. Now we can go wherever we want with this. Um, so I'm going to quickly scan and my dog is ready. It's not a terribly long sentence. It won't be. Uh, why? Because you won't remember it? <laughs> exactly. Um, all right. I'm just going to read. Um, a line of dialogue. We don't know who's saying this or why okay. they're saying this. <clears throat> For fuck's sake, does it matter? <laughs> I asked for a short sentence. Yeah. For fuck's sake, does it matter? Of course it matters. It all matters. Fuck. It's not very good. Okay, uh, of course it matters. It all matters. That's what you never seem to understand. There's two sentences. You can do as much as you want, but I'll go. Um, Jonathan doesn't sure. seem to understand what the word matter means when it comes to murder. That's All it took was one bullet to make the difference in this conversation. And now knowing they only had about five minutes for the cops would arrive. It wasn't time to dissect who was right and who was wrong. But there was more than one bullet. Jonathan did not know. And Jane lifted the SIG and shot him in the head. Then, uh, then wipe the, wipe the gun down put his hand around it, his right hand around it, um, and drop the gun into the dusty four boards. Jane slipped into her leather coat, oh, first. popped the collar as if it would make a difference, and headed out the door. And she turned and she considered her dead ex on the floor, thinking it had been many years that she wanted to do this very thing. And thinking as well, nobody was going to believe this was a suicide. <laughs> but she knew this time it didn't matter. Oh, I like that. I think we end that there. That's That was kind of poetic. It's tough to start with dialogue. I wasn't even thinking dialogue. You know, I, know. I didn't think that was a possibility. Oh, oh, my, look at th this look is at my uh, this is my writing companion. She's about sixteen months old, and oh, she's uh, kind of a pain in the ass, but she's also kind of awesome. <laughs> I'm this looking to get another Scully. doggy myself. Oh yeah, what did you have? What was your previous? I had labs all my life. Uh, Angus was a yellow lab. Had blacks all my life. Oh, and um, I'm wondering how I'm going to be <laughs> if I get a puppy. How I'm going to be able to give him the him or her the uh, energy they need while I'm trying to write. So we'll figure that out. Yep, yep, yep. I I went through all of. I'm still going through all of that. It's just like <laughs> literally trying to climb into it. Oh, what a good doggy! Well, listen, Matt. Great catching up with you. It's been a while yeah. since since we talked, and uh, congratulations on uh, on the end of the series. Uh, that's uh, that's a, a, a pretty big moment. So, and and best of luck um, writing in third person. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And good luck <laughs> on your uh, your comic book project. <laughs> All right, buddy. We'll talk soon. <laughs> Take care. Bye. So that's it. That was my conversation with Matt Coyle, uh, complete with a little murder mystery at the end. Well, I guess it wasn't so much of a mystery. I guess uh, it was pretty clear who did the murdering. Um, Matt Coyle's uh, most recent release is the end of his 10 book series featuring Rick Cahill and that book is called Odyssey's End so I highly recommend you check out not only that book but his entire series. You can find out more about him and his books at mattcoylebooks.com and while you're on the internet go ahead and pop on over to my website carterwilson.com you can check out um, my event dates, my books, uh, you can sign up for my newsletter and you can read about my uh, writing retreats and my one-on-one -on -one coaching available to writers at all levels. That is it for now, friends. I appreciate you watching and or listening as always. More episodes coming out next week. In the meantime, take care.